you're new to our church today, uh, my name is Pastor Brad, and uh, I've been out of the pulpit for a few weeks here, four weeks. We uh, went through a summer series called uh, Summer Spotlight, where we have speakers come in. We had four speakers over the last four weeks in June, and, uh, and so we've gotten out of that. We're getting back into kind of the normal, and the normal for us is what we call expository preaching, and what that means is we take books of the Bible, we break them down chapter by chapter, verse by verse, our goal to better understand God's Word and who He is and how that applies to our life. We've been doing that for the last year and uh, probably for the next year uh, through the book of Genesis. If you're not familiar with this book, it's the first book in the Bible. It's called the Book of Beginnings. It's where everything starts uh, in, in, in really human history as God creates the earth and mankind. And so we've been working our way through that. We are uh, at, we, at a section of, of Genesis called the Patriarch section, and it really focuses around three specific men, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are important men in the Bible. Uh, they're important because these are the men from whom the Jewish nation uh, will come. And so the modern day Israel is a result of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. More importantly, though, is that it's also through this, this people group and this nation that God promises to bring the Redeemer of mankind, and His name is Jesus. And it's so important that we understand this. In fact, the gospel writer Matthew wants us to understand this. In Matthew chapter 1, if we jump forward to the New Testament, he starts the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, by telling us this, that, the, that the, his gospel is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so Matthew makes this connection for us. That's why this is so important. We need to understand that the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are directly connected to our faith. And so we're spending some time walking through their lives, trying to understand who they were, how God worked in their life, and what that means for us. And so we're going to look today in chapter 15. That's where we're at today. Chapter 15, verses 1 through 6 will be our passage today. And, uh, and we're going to walk through that. And I want to begin this morning uh, by giving you just a question to think about. Because I think, I think as we move into this passage, I, I want you to kind of have a mindset here. And the question is this, have you ever gotten impatient waiting on God? Anybody ever been there? Like, if we're just really honest this morning, like, like there's maybe a promise God gave us or there's something we, we feel like God said He's going to do in our life or there's something we want Him to do in our life, but we find ourselves getting impatient, waiting on God to do what we think He said He was going to do or His Word says He's going to do. Like, for example, maybe, maybe you just felt like God was going to heal you of something or He's going to heal a friend of something. You just, you're holding on to that promise, but it but it's just not happening, and you're kind of getting impatient. Or maybe, maybe I don't know, maybe you're asking God to fix your marriage. You're like, can you fix him? Can you fix her? You know, and, and you're trying to do all the biblical things right to be the godly wife, the godly husband, but it just, it just doesn't feel like you're getting anywhere. Or maybe you're that parent, right, that you're trusting God. You're, there's like this scripture, we all, as parents, we all rely on. If you raise up a child in the way he will go, he will not depart from it. And you're like holding on to that promise, but the, but the reality is like, that just like your kid's getting worse. Or maybe you've been asking God to help you with some kind of work situation and like you're just holding on to this promise that you know, if I trust God, if I'm nice, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm Christ-like to people, but guess what? People are they're just treating you like crap. And you're like, where, God, where are you at in this? Like I'm trying to hold on to this promise and it just seems like you're not showing up. I ask you this question today because as we come to our passage, this is where Abram's at. Like he's been given this promise that God has given him. But it just feels like, I think, as we see in the passage today, that God's not coming through on the promise, at least in the way Abram thinks he should. You say, what was the promise? The promise was that through Abram, there would be this great nation and that through him would come this promised redeemer one day. That's the promise God makes Abram. It's a big promise. And yet, as, as Abram waits on the promise, it, it almost appears that God's not making good on it. In fact, it almost feels like it's impossible that he could. But let's just step back for a moment and let's just acknowledge that we serve a God that keeps his promises. Amen? So what that tells us from the beginning, before we even get into the passage this morning, what that tells us is that what Abram is facing isn't a God problem, it's an Abraham problem. Because God always keeps his promises. And I think when we think of what's happening in our lives and our trust of God in our lives, that if we're growing frustrated or, and, and we're like getting impatient with God, that it's not a God problem. It's a me problem, right? It's a you problem. 
And that's true of anything. That's true of our marriage, our finances, our, our children, our, our work situation. I mean, as we're, our health or whatever it is, we're kind of, we're, we're like frustrated because it's not happening in the way we think we, it should or we're looking at it or like that's impossible for it to happen. And you know what? In that moment, that's not a God problem. He keeps his promises. It's an us problem. And I think the problem is, is we haven't fully maybe comprehended or, or maybe we don't understand how God's promises work. And so our goal here today, and really the next two weeks, is we're going we're gonna to break chapter 15 down into four principles. We're going to look at two of them today. Two, four principles of how God works in his promises. And I think this is going to be really applicable for us. And, and, I, and I hope as we look at this today that you'll begin to see that, that while God has given you promises, there is a certain way that he works in his promises. So that is our basis. We're going to go to chapter 15, verse 1. We're going to look at the first six verses. Here's what the writer says. He says, after these things, and after these things, talking about the previous chapter. So if you haven't been with us, go, to, go back to the last message in Genesis, and you can catch up here. But after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield, and your, your reward shall be very great. I'm going to stop here just for a second. What, what we have here is, is that God's reaffirming the promise. He's made this promise already a couple times to Abram. So now here in chapter 15, verse 1, he's reaffirming it. Abram, I just want you to know that I'm your protector, I'm your guardian, and you're going to have a great reward. And the reward he's talking about is the promise that one day he's going to have this, he's going to be the father of this great, this nation and this promised redeemer. So God's reaffirming the promise. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? I continue childless. The heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my own household is going to be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. He took, then he brought him outside, and he said, Look towards heaven. Number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So we have a lot happening here, but what I want to do this morning is break these six verses into two principles when it comes to how God works in his promises. Here's the first principle I want us to see this morning. Number one, that God's promises are fulfilled on his terms, not ours. You like that? Well, it's true. God's promises are fulfilled on his terms and not ours. And we see this almost from the beginning in this passage as God reaffirms the promise that he's made to Abram. And how many of you are thankful that God reaffirms promises? Like he says, I'm going to do this, right? But here's what's interesting is Abram's response initially is, but, but God, but God, you haven't given me an offspring, but God, I'm childless. But God, the only person in my household that could possibly be my heir is Eliezer of Damascus. You're like, who is this guy? We don't know. The next closest thing to a son he has, I guess. He says, God, you've given me no offspring. I guess a member of my own household is going to have to be my heir. You know, it's interesting here is God makes this promise of, this, of him having future descendants and, and the Redeemer to come through him. And, and the first thing that Abram says after God reaffirms the promise is, but God, that can't happen. And he begins to rationalize his own solution for the promise. He's like, you know, the only thing that makes sense to me, God, is that it would come through my servant, Eleazar. That's the only thing that makes sense. That's the only thing. That's the only way it could happen. Why would he think that? Because while we're not told yet, at this point in time, Abram is 90 years old and his wife, Sarah, is 80. How many of you ladies know she's past childbearing age? Any, anybody want to have a child at 80? Dear God, no, right? that's that's what he's looking at though he's like this the the only way you can fulfill this god is if it's through eliezer it's the only thing that makes sense to me and isn't that exactly what we do when it comes to the promises of god instead of trusting god for his way his timing we begin to try to rationalize our own way our own timing our own solution to help god fulfill his promise and we do it all the time don't we For example, maybe you're a teenager or a single adult this morning. I see my three boys up front here. And you know what I believe about my boys? That I believe that there's a special someone for each of them. 
Don't, you, don't we all believe that this morning? I believe there's, there's some special ladies out there that God has ordained for my boys. I believe that. And, and I hope they believe that. But we all remember being a teenager, right? And we, what happens when we get impatient? You know, we, we want to find that person right away. And, and, and before, before we know it, we want, to find that we want to be married. We want to have kids. We want to have a family. We want all those things. And we get impatient waiting on God to bring this person into our lives. And so we, we step in and we take control, right? So I'm going to download the dating app. I'm going to, I'm going to go to the party. I'm going to go to the bar. You know, I'm going, to, I'm, you know, I'm going to lower my standard. I guess my standards are too high. I'm going to lower my standards. We try to come up with the, our own solution. Maybe you're a parent here today. You have a child that's running from God. And you're holding on to that promise I just talked about that you raise up a child and the way he will go, he will not depart from it. You did that. You brought him to church. They were in Sunday school. You made sure they knew Jesus. I mean, you, all of that. But the reality is they're, they're running from God. And you're sitting there wondering, God, when are you going to make good on your promise? Because I did all the things that you said to do, and I don't see you working. And so you find yourself trying to insert yourself into the equation. Like, maybe I need to do something to fix this, right? And you start trying to rationalize your own way of trying to, to, to maybe bring your kids back to Jesus. You know, you're like, no, and parents are doing it in weird ways today. So, like, some parents are like, well, maybe I just need to accept that my child's gay. What? Maybe I just need to pacify their rebellious nature. Oh, I guess I just need to try to be their friend. I know, I know I'll just be their friend instead of their parent. Because apparently, God's promise isn't coming through. I'm tired of waiting. She's not in here this service, but there's a lady in here last service. She told me one time, I've never forgotten it. She's telling me about how her son was running from God. She'd raised him in the church and all that kind of stuff. And she's, she's, she's going to God. And she's like, I was telling God, like, God, I don't know what you're doing. But I've, I've done everything you said to do. And I, I don't understand why you're not moving in this situation. And she said, sure enough, he smacked me right in the face. And he said, you know what? I'm trying to, but every time I try to, you get in my way. I'm just telling you, mom and dad, sometimes we got to remove ourselves and let the promise of God play out in God's timing and His way. Amen? It's just the truth. That's how it works. He works in that way. Here's another one. A lot of people get tired of me saying this and think, Pastor just wants money. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, our church is blessed. So this isn't about the church needing money. This is about you being blessed. Because the Bible says there's a promise that if you trust God with the tithe, that He will take care of your financial needs. But here's the problem. People look at that and they, they go, well, that can't be true. That doesn't make any sense. If I give 10% of my income, God can do more with that than I could do with 100%. That pastor, you know what my financial advisor would say about that? I know what your financial advisor would say about that. He would say that doesn't make sense. That's impossible. But you know what? It also doesn't make sense that a 90-year-old and an 80-year-old could have a baby, does it? But God's true to his promises. That's how that works. And he can do it in any way he wants to. And so, so what we have here is Abram is looking at the promise of God and he's saying, you know what? This doesn't make sense to me. I've got to, I've got to somehow fulfill this on my terms and in my way. And what we see in the passage is God does not appreciate this. Because here's what God says to him. He says, he says, Abram, this man shall not be your heir. Abram, this isn't the way this is going to happen. Listen, your very own son shall be your heir. Listen, Abram, here's the deal. I know you don't think it's possible, but you be in 90 and Sarah be in 80. In fact, by, just so you know, he's going to be 100 and she's going to be 90 before it happens. But you, just, you just need to know you're having a child. Get used to the idea. Go buy a crib. You know, go get your, go get your deal at Target all set up. You're having a baby. Stop trying to hijack my promise. I'm going to do it my way, not your way. That's what he's saying to Abram. Think of it like this. If somebody makes you a promise, whose job is it to fulfill it? It's their job, right? Like if your spouse says to you, I will do the dishes, I promise, by the end of the day. Now, whose, whose job is it to do the dishes? 
That's your spouse's job, right? Like, you can, you can be free of the dishes now. You can walk into the rest of your day and know when I come home tonight, there is going to be an empty sink. You're like, Pastor, you don't know my spouse, right? But you know what? I'll give you this. Because we're human, we don't always keep our promises, do we? And sometimes you do have to insert yourself into the promise equation because somebody didn't fulfill their word. But here's what you need to understand about God. With God, you never have to do that. Because here's what God says about Himself. God is not a man that He should lie. If He says He's going to do the dishes, He's going to do the dishes. Or a son of man that He should change His mind. He's not going to change His mind about it. He has said and will He not do it? Or has He spoken and He will not fulfill it? God says, listen, you just need to know something about Me. I am a promise-keeping God. If I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. So stop trying to do it for me, please. I'll take care of it. And you know what, church? There's, there's a lot of rest in that. There's a lot of hope in that if, we'll just, if we're just willing to step back and stop trying to figure it out and stop trying to come up with our own solutions, stop trying to fix it, and that, that, that just trust that God has a way and it'll be on His terms and in His timing. Amen? You might say, well, Pastor, Man, how do you do that? That's the second principle. God's promises are fulfilled through our faith in Him. Our faith in Him. We see this in verse 5 as, as, as God intercedes in this. God says, listen, come with me, Abraham. He takes him outside. He says, I want you to look towards the heavens. Number the stars if you're able to number them. And then He said to him, so shall your offspring be. So what God does in this moment is after declaring to Abram that he's going to have a son, he takes him outside. He says, I want you to look up at the heavens, Abram. Is it possible for you to count the stars? Rhetorical question. The answer is no. But he says, Abram, I just want you to know you're, you're, this is what your offspring is going to be like. Like, I want to put such blessing in your life that you can't even fathom or count it. That's the kind of blessing that God wants to bring into Abram's life. I mean, that's pretty awesome, right? Imagine God takes you outside and says, look at the stars of the sky. You can't count the amount of blessing that I want to bring into your life. In fact, I'm going to show you in a moment that he actually wants that for you. But here he is offering it to Abram. Abram, I want to give you eternity. That's what this, what this promise is. So stop, 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 stop trying to do it in your way, and trust me that my way is best. So what does Abram do? Pretty interesting. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. I'm going to stop here for a moment, because this, this is like one of the most important statements, I think, in the Old Testament. I'm going to show you how it links to the New Testament here in a second. And I think this is probably the most important monumental moment in Abram's life. Because what this is and what we're seeing right here is what I would call for Abram a salvation moment. It's a salvation moment. I want you to think about this because here's what it's saying. Up until this point, the implication here is he hasn't, what, believed. I mean, God has been making this promise for a couple chapters. Like this goes back to before he ever left the land and headed out on the journey God had for him, God is promising this to him all the way along. And it's, it's up until this point that he hasn't believed it. He's heard it. God's said it many times. But he hasn't believed it. But now all of a sudden, he believes it. And you say, well, what's the big deal about this? The big deal is, is that this, this idea of believe, it's not just that he, he acknowledged it, it's this idea that he had faith in it. He had faith in it. It's like, it's like the light bulb came on in this moment. It's, it's like the, all of a sudden he saw it in a way he'd never seen it before. As he, for the first time, he actually believes and puts his faith in the promise that God has given him. And it's so monumental. It's such a big moment for Abraham that we're told he counted it to him as righteousness. You say, what does that mean? It means this is the salvation moment for Abraham. This is, the mo this is his come to Jesus moment. This is the moment that, that he, he's like all in, and in this moment, God transfers righteousness to him. 
Now you might say, well, pastor, how does that work? Because I've always heard you say that the only way a person is saved is through faith in who? Jesus, right? In fact, Jesus said that. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's a fact. Paul, if we doubt that, Paul affirms it. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. So yes, salvation, right relationship with God, righteousness being counted to you, faith in Jesus. Question then is, how can Abram, how can Abram experience salvation when he doesn't even know who Jesus is? When we're thousands of years away from the manger, how is it that Abram is having righteousness credited it to him? And what we need to understand is that Abram isn't just putting his hope in or his faith in that God's going to give him a bunch of descendants. What he's putting in his faith, what's finally registered in his heart, his mind, his spirit, is that through him a Redeemer will come. And Abram puts his faith in that. A promised Redeemer. No, he doesn't know his name. He'll never meet him in his lifetime. But he believes, just like you and I believe in him today. Have you met Jesus personally? Have you interacted with him physically? Yet you believe. Abram believes. He believes there's a future Redeemer. He doesn't know his name, but he's putting his faith in that. He's, he's finally trusting that God has this big plan that he didn't understand, but now all of a sudden he's beginning to understand it and he's seen it in a way he's never seen it before. And he goes, I believe it. I put my faith in that. And God says, bingo. And he credits it to him as righteousness. Now you might say, well, pastor, how do you know that? How do you know that's really what's happening? Romans chapter four, Paul connects all the dots for us. Look at this. Romans chapter four. He says, this is why it depends on faith. And what Paul is doing here is he's making a case that your salvation is not based on anything you can do. You can't go to church enough. You can't be good enough. You, you, you can't go, go through enough classes. I mean, you can, you can do everything you think you can do to be right with God. It'll never be enough. And what Paul is saying here is the only way that you can be saved is by faith in Jesus. That's it. That's it. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. See, what we see happening in Genesis chapter 15, Abram, God takes Abram outside. He shows him all the, the stars. He says, this is going to be your offspring. And what clicks is he realized all of a sudden, this isn't just about me having kids. This is much bigger than that. This is about, this, this is about the salvation of many souls. Not just the nation that, that, that will come from me, but many nations, many people groups will come to faith in what I'm believing right now, and they will be saved. It, the light bulb comes on in this moment for him. And then Paul goes on to say this, in hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. Not just one nation, many nations, all of us, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which is as good as dead, since he was about 100 years, old, 100 years old. Let me just say to this to my boys down here that think 51 is old. No, not dead yet, okay? Got to get to 100 years first, right? Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. She's like, God, she's 90. Like, she can't have kids, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that what? That God was able to do what he had promised. He believes it. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Now, here's the really important part for you and me. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. But for ours also. How so? It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses, raised for our justification. Now, Paul has said a lot here, but here's the nutshell. He's trying to get the point across. Abram believed in God's promise. He had faith in the promise and God credited it to him as righteousness. In the same way that you and I put our hope in the promise, the promise of a redeemer, we know His name is Jesus, and God credits His righteousness to us. Amen? That's what, and that's why we're saved. Now, you might be thinking, okay, pastor, this is pretty theological today, pretty heady. It's interesting. I see how it's important. 
But how does this apply to my life day to day? In closing this morning, I want to give you two applications to consider when it comes to the promises of God. The first one is just simply this, that if you want God to work in your life, you have to stop doing it your way. If you want God to work in your life, really simple, you have to stop doing it your way. We see this with Abram. It's not until he finally stops trying to do it his way that God is able to work in his way. Isn't that true? And we're going to see that as we move further into Genesis. He's going to have a son, guys. She's going to birth a son at 90 years old. It's a, it's a miracle. It's going to happen. Couldn't happen, though, until Abram came to this point where he takes his hands off of it. And you know what? The same is true for us. The fact is there are, there, there are some here today. You want God to work in your life. You want to see his promises in your life. But the problem is you want them on your terms. You want them in your timing. You want them based on your rationale. And then that, then that what we want? I want to understand this. Ha ha ha. Guess what? You don't always get to understand what God's going to do. But you want that. You want your solutions. And here's, here's the reality. You can live like that. You can live like that. But I promise you this. You will never experience the fulfillment that God has for you, nor the blessing He wants to bring into your life when you're trying to fulfill His promises in your way. And that's true of your marriage. That's true of your finances. That's true of your parenting. That's true of your friendships. That's true of your workplace. That's true of your physical, mental health, and especially your spiritual state. God has so much He wants to do in and through your life. So much blessing. But He can't do that until you take your hands off the wheel. Until you trust that He is a promise keeper that keeps His promises. Amen? Now here's the challenge. Some of you don't even understand what that means. Part of it is you've never been exposed to God's Word in this way possibly. You, you didn't know there were promises. You didn't know that God wanted to work in your life. You didn't know He wanted to bring, bring blessing. You didn't know about this relationship with Jesus that you could have. I mean, you've grown, up with, you've grown up with this idea that you just have to be a good person or you have to attend a certain church and you've just never really understood or realized that there's these promises and this blessing that God wants to bring into your life. And I'm here to tell you this morning that He wants to bring promise and blessing into your life. You say, where's it at? It's in His Word. You start there. Somebody asked me in first service, where do you start with this? You pick up your Bible because there's, there's promise after promise after promise after promise and they're for you and they're for me. And God wants to work those promises into your life. But you don't know about those promises until you start reading about those promises. Amen? And my hope for you, my encouragement to you, my challenge to you is that you'll begin to be more exposed to what God wants to do in your life. And again, I don't say that to make you feel bad. It might not even be your fault that you don't know. You just, you, just, you just didn't know. Now you know. Now you know. God has promises He wants to fulfill in your life. And the biggest one is He wants you to know His Son, Jesus. Amen? Now, here's the other challenge. Some of you here today, you know the promises. You grew up reading about them. You've been to Sunday school. You, you've read the Bible. You know exactly what God's promises are. But you're kind of like Abram. You're hearing it, but it's not, it's not registering. Like You know what God is saying, but, but, but you continue to try to do it your way. And you're doing that in a number of ways in your life. And, and you're wondering, why is my life chaotic? Why is it a mess? Why, why, aren't, why is my marriage struggling? Why are my kids out of control? I mean, and, and what's going on? Could it be? Could it be? That while you know the promises of God and what He says about all these different things in your life, you're not living the promises. You're trying to do it your own way. Maybe you're trying to handle your finances in your own way. And you can do that. Nobody's going to force you to tithe. Nobody's going to make you give any money. Nobody's gonna, I'm not going to ever force you to trust God with your finances. But I'm just telling you, if you don't trust God with your finances, you're not going to experience the promise that comes from trusting God with your finances. Amen? Another example is your children. Now, these are two... I'm stepping on toes this morning, all right? I mean, I'm going to... I hope you wore steel-toed shoes this morning because I want to I wanna talk to parents right now just for a moment. And I want to say a couple things before I, get, before I share this application. One, I love you. I think it's important you know that before I say anything. I love you and I care about you. 
And I care about your kids. Second thing I want to say is I, I'm not against sports. Oh, you know where I'm going with this, don't you? I'm not against sports. I'm not against dance. I'm not against whatever activity that you have your kids in. I'm not against those things. And here's, here's how you can know I'm not against it. I, my daughter played college basketball. She was a national champion. Um, I spent many years on a bench watching her play, okay? So I am not anti-sports. I played sports. I, I, I enjoyed sports. I am pro-boundary. And what I mean by that is I think you have to put boundaries around sports. So for example, when it came to our daughter, we had traveling teams she was on. And as long as we were, you know, in town and it wasn't on a Sunday, she could play. It was on a Sunday she couldn't play. When it came to traveling, we gave her two Sundays a year that she could travel. Now, I can promise you her traveling coaches did not appreciate that. I'll never forget one of the traveling coaches calling me one day and, and giving it to me up one side and down the other about how Tristan was never going to play sports anywhere, how she was never going to be good enough. And, and after all we've done for you, Pastor, I mean, he, he went that far. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you, I'll give you this. You can pick the two weekends a year she plays. And he hung up the phone on me. Yet she played college basketball, full ride scholarship, graduated with no debt, national champion. I don't say that to brag. I'm just, I'm just telling you that we were pro-boundary. And we're pro-boundary because we believe God would honor that. And here's the problem in our culture today. Our culture has convinced parents that if your child is not a part of some activity seven days a week, 24-7, 365 days a week, that, that they're going to miss out on something. And as a result of that, they're not going to be successful in their life. And the real problem for me is that thinking has crept into the church. I was reminded of that last Sunday. And please hear me by saying this. I don't think if your kids are doing weekend sports and you're gone here and there that you don't care about your child's spiritual development. Okay, And I understand there's weeks we're gone and, and, and I, I get that. But I was reminded of it this past weekend. My wife and I were in Lincoln and we were staying in this hotel. And, uh, and number one, I realized that when I booked the hotel, it was, it was more expensive than normal. I was like, well, that seems high, but I guess it is what it is. But then we got to the hotel and, and on Sunday morning, I, just, I, I was going to go to church and I went down in the lobby and I was really just kind of shocked. The lobby was packed full of young families. I mean, they were everywhere. Kids running everywhere. And you might say, well, Pastor, it's vacation time. It's summer. That, why would that surprise you? I get that, but, but they were all wearing uniforms. Very obvious that we're, we're here this weekend in Lincoln because there's a baseball, softball tournament going on. I mean, it's very obvious, you know. And all of a sudden, the, the exorbitant price for the room made a lot of sense because don't think the hotels don't capitalize off you parents. And so I'm like, oh my goodness. This, and then I just honestly kind of bothered me. I'm thinking of like all the time, all the resources, all the investment these parents are making in their kids and church is not a priority. Now you might say, oh, pastor, that sounds kind of judgy. Maybe it is, but it, it's just an observation I'm making because I, think that, I don't think that I'm the only hotel that morning where that's happening. I'm thinking Lincoln's the only city where that's happening. I think it's become a terrible thing that's happening in our culture. I decided, though, to not worry about it, not let it ruin my day. So I got my car, and I GPS to the church I was going to and uh, started driving. I realized I'm hungry. And you know why I'm hungry? Because all those kids were eating all the breakfast in, in the hotel. I, I couldn't even get in line. I was like, you know, I'm going to stop at McDonald's. I'm going to get an Egg McMuffin. But, you know, then I, saw, then I saw my favorite restaurant. I was like, no, instead, I'm going to go there. I saw a Chick-fil-A, and I'm like, I'm going to get a breakfast Chick-fil-A sandwich. And I, and I noticed there's nobody in the line. I'm gonna, I'll, it'll be quick, and I can get to church. And so I pull in there, and you know what I realized in that moment? The Chick-fil-A is what? Closed on Sundays. Closed on Sundays. Empty parking lot on Sunday. Why is Chick-fil-A closed on a Sunday? Have you ever wondered that? Have you ever researched that? Let me tell you why. As Truett Cathy believed, he's the founder, in the importance and value 
of setting a day aside for rest and worship. Why did he believe that? Well, he's a Christian, number one. But he believed that God would honor him for honoring the Sabbath. He wanted his employees to honor the Sabbath. And so he said, we're not working on the Sabbath. We're closing the store on the Sabbath. And the world thinks he's crazy. It bothers the media, just so you know. They're bothered by it. But you know what? God has blessed him as a result. In fact, I did a little research and I was just thinking, I wonder, being closed you know, one day a week, how that compares to other restaurants that are open seven days a week. And so I looked at what Chick-fil-A's like sales are. And it's interesting, the average Chick-fil-A restaurant, like the one in Manhattan or one in Lincoln or wherever, the average restaurant has annual sales of $8.7 million. You say, was that a lot of money? Well, it'd be for me a lot of money. I don't know about for you, but yeah, that's a lot of money. But then I was like, I'm going to compare that to my second favorite breakfast. And I don't like it for other things, but breakfast, I like the Egg McMuffin. It's like, I wonder what McDonald's open seven days a week, and in some cases, 24 hours. I wonder what a McDonald's does annually, the average McDonald's, seven days a week. $3.7 million. Isn't that interesting? That Chick-fil-A honors the Sabbath, takes a day off from sales, and as a result, generates three, almost three times the revenue of one of the most popular restaurant chains in the world. Why? Because I believe God is honoring this family for honoring Him. Amen? Now here's my challenge to parents. Here's what I'm going to propose to you. That the world has told you a lie. And the lie is that your kids have to be busy seven days a week and in some kind of activity seven days a week in order for them to be successful in this life. And I'm here to tell you this morning, that promise is not true. That promise is not true. That will not bring, they might be successful, but that that will not bring the kind of success that you should truly want for your child. Because true success, honestly, at the end of the day is what? That they know Jesus. Isn't it? 20 years from now, guys, 30 years from now, What's the most important thing? That your kids know Jesus. That they know Him. And I'm just telling you, I have a feeling that if you were to trust God's Word, not only to honor the Sabbath, but think about this. I'm going to train up a child in the way he should go. That statement, we, we look at that statement, we go, you know what, that's, that's, he's talking about training up in God's Word. Let's, let's pull it back out of God's Word and let's just look at that statement out of God's Word. Train up a child in the way he will go. He will not depart from it. Train up a child to think sports is the most important thing in their life. And guess what? They will not depart from it. Train up a child to believe that they don't have to go to church to know Jesus. And they will depart. They will not depart from it. You see what I'm saying? I mean, that that biblical principle can go the other way if we're not careful. So my challenge to you is make most important what's important that they know Jesus. Typically, that means one day a week, a Sunday, we say no to sports. We we say no to shoot around at the high school on Sunday night. Oh, pastor, you just don't understand. Pastor, I get what you're saying. But if my child isn't at every practice on Sundays as well, they won't play. You just need to know that, Pastor. They, may, they, they keep track. And I want Junior and Susie to play. Here's my challenge to you. That what's at stake is not their playing time, but something much more important. Because Jesus says, what does it profit a man or woman if they gain the whole world? If they become the best athlete, state champion, you know, play for the Chiefs, whatever. But they lose their soul. What good is that? Listen, I'm not trying to beat up parents this morning because this doesn't just apply to parenting. This applies to every part of our lives, church. Our finances, our marriages, 
our workplace. All of it. it. We either trust God that His promises are true or we don't. And listen, if that offends you, I, I, just, I just want to challenge you to consider God's Word and maybe ask yourself your question. Do I really believe He's a promise-keeping God? Because if you do believe that, then you can trust what He says in His Word about your finances, about your marriage, about your kids, and you can trust that if you'll do what He's asked you to do, He will come through. Might not be in the way you thought it should be, might not be in the timing you want it to be, but He will come through. And He's going to bring more blessing in His way than you could ever in your way. This brings us to one final application as Brooklyn comes. If, if I want God's promises in my life, I have to make Jesus Lord of my life. Here's what I want us to understand this morning, that all of this centers in our faith in Jesus. Let me put it like this. Like Abram, you and I have to come to this, this moment where we have a light bulb experience, an understanding you know, that everything in this life is about Him. And that God wants to give us something more than what we see. That there's something beyond this. There's eternity beyond this. And God has so much blessing He wants to bring into our life. And it comes through one source. And His name is Jesus. And He wants that for you. He wants that for you. I, I think, I, I believe this. I believe God's burden for you to have that. If you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about, right? Have you ever wanted something for your children so bad you can taste it? Like, you know, and it's just like, I'm telling you right now, I'm, I've experienced the joy of being a grandparent, and now I'm experiencing the challenge of being a grandparent as I watch my own kid, you know, you know hurting for his kid. And it's just reminded me, this is how God feels. God wants things for us so bad. He wants us to know Him. He wants to fulfill promises in our lives. But really what it comes down to, are we willing to believe that, put our faith in that, put our hope in that? That's what it comes down to. I think for all of us this morning, we have to be willing to ask ourselves that question. And maybe you're here this morning, and this is all new to you. You, you didn't even know about the promises. You didn't know what God, you didn't know He wanted to have this relationship with you. You, you you didn't know. And I just want to I just want to challenge you this morning that maybe to consider there's a God in heaven who loves you. And he brought you here this morning. And he wants you to know about his son. And he wants you to know he has promises for you and blessing for you beyond your wild wildest dreams. But for you to have it, you have to stop trying to figure your life out on your own. You have to stop coming up with your own solutions. You have to surrender it to Him and say, God, I believe what you have is more than I could ever give myself. So I let go of that and I trust in your promise. Maybe for some of us, maybe we're the ones that know the promises, but we, we're not living the promises. And my challenge to you is to come back to, sometimes the Bible calls us to come back to our first love. You know, that's one of the churches in Revelation Jesus says to them, you've lost sight of your first love. Who's your first love? It's Jesus. And sometimes we lose sight of Him and we, the world confuses us and, and we get caught up in the, the hubbub of world activity and, and the success that world that says this is a success and, and we lose sight of what's really important. And maybe for some of us this morning, whether it's in our finances, our parenting, our marriage, or whatever the case is, we've lost sight that, that I have to trust the promise of God. Not the promise of the world, not the promise of my own desire, but the promise of God the Father. Amen? And for you and I, we come back Listen, the last couple of weeks I've had to do that. I'm just being, I'm being transparent with you. Like I've seen my son have more faith than me. That's humbling. When you realize, man, I thought I was functioning at this level, but I'm at this level. Why am I at this level? What, what's keeping me from trusting God in the way I need to trust Him? And you got, sometimes you got to step back and ask yourself that question and say, God, what is it that needs to change here? Because I, I want to trust you for all of it, not just some of it. God, I want all the blessing, not just what I can, I can bring into my life. Amen? I think we all have to step back and say, God, what is it that needs to change? What am I not believing? What are, what, what have you said to me? And I, it's just not registering. What helped me to grasp onto that, to believe that, to put my faith in that, 
take my hands off the wheel and let you drive. Amen? Here's why we should do this. And I'll close with this. The writer, the writer of Hebrews says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, and let me just say this, we're in the last days, just so you know. The last days are from the time that Jesus ascends into heaven and he returns. People say, are we in the last days, Pastor? Yep, been in them for a couple thousand years. So in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. But the writer's reminding us here this morning is what we're putting our hope in. His name is Jesus. Listen, he is the heir of all things. He created the world. He, he sits enthroned above all. Everything is in his power and it's in his control. And he's made promises to you and he wants to bless you. That's who we're talking about this morning. And all you have to do to receive it is like Abram, put your faith in it and say, I give up. <laughs> I trust you, Lord. And in that moment, here's what God does. He credits it to us as righteousness. And then the blessings and promises of God come to fruition in our life. Amen? Lord, we thank you today for your word. And Lord, it as always is convicting, it's challenging. It's also, it's also very encouraging. Lord, to know, Jesus, that you sit on high right now, enthroned in heaven above. And Lord, you know every situation we're facing. You know the challenges we're facing. Lord, you know for each of us, you know where we struggle to trust you. You know our flaws. You know our weakness. What's amazing, Lord, is despite all that, you still love us. You're still burdened for us. You care for us. So Lord, I pray for each of us this morning. Help us in our weakness. Help us in our lack of trust. Help us, Lord, to, to hold on to your promises and not let go. Help us to, to let go of the wheel. Help us to, to not try to make things happen and help us not to try to look for our own solutions. But Lord, help us to trust that your plan and your way is not only the best way, it's the only way. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in every heart and soul in this room this morning. I pray for those that don't know you, Lord, that today would be that light bulb moment, Lord, where they... They would say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. Lord, I pray for those that maybe have, have asked you to be Lord of their life, but Lord, they're not living like you're Lord of their life. I pray, Lord, that you'd help them to, to, to come back to their first love and Lord, to, to, to reaffirm their faith in you this morning and to begin to walk with you again. Lord, help us today to be what you've called us to be, to trust in you and your promises. And we pray this today in Jesus' name, amen.